Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our morning service from Terrington St. Clement Parish Church. It's great to have you with us, whether you're a regular member of our church family or whether you're visiting us, so to speak, today. It's great to have you with us. You're very welcome indeed. Well, we're going to have a riot at church uh, this morning. Uh, there's not very many of us here, but we're going to have a riot in a manner of speaking because our walk through the middle part of the Acts of the Apostles through Paul the Apostle's second missionary journey brings us uh, to the famous riot in Ephesus this week, and Mark will be talking us, to us uh, about that in a little while. More on that later. Uh, for now, I'll just remind you that our home groups uh, meet, as usual, uh, by Zoom this week, continuing their uh, pre-Christmas series uh, on the person of Jesus. Then our Chris Dingle service this year will be streamed online at 4 p.m. on Sunday the 6th of December. So that's a fortnight today. Our Chris Dingle service will be streamed online, and that will be preceded by a family event around the village on Saturday the 5th of December. Our plans for that are well advanced, uh, and uh, we'll be making more details about that available next week. So we look forward to that. At 11.30 this morning, we uh, have our Zoomed coffee together time, so uh, please uh, be there for that if you can, chance to catch up with each other. And uh, I'm also told that today is Belinda Sutton's birthday, so uh, happy birthday, Belinda, and a happy birthday to anybody else as well if it's your birthday today. Uh, many happy returns from all of us. One other thing, if the uh, live stream drops at all uh, this morning, please don't worry, the service will be uh, uh, on the YouTube channel later anyway. I'm told that the connection is slightly dodgy this morning, so uh, should be okay, but if it drops, then you can uh, catch up later anyway. For now, though, let's uh, continue. I'm assuming you can still see me and hear me at the moment, of course. Let's continue with uh, our introduction to remind us of why we've come together, uh, and the words for this will be on the screen. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Well, we're going to uh, offer our praise and thanksgiving now in our first song, which expresses our Christian confidence in the one who is our king, our priest, and our apostle. The song, Jesus is King, and I will extol him.
Well, because our priest has died for us, we can come to him to say sorry for our failings, to think and speak and live as he would wish, knowing that if we are truly repentant, we are forgiven and right with him forever. So now we come to our confession, the words for which will be on the screen. And together we say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought, word, and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's time now for us to hear the word of the Lord, and Fitty is going to bring us our next reading through uh, from the book of Acts. The reading today is from Acts chapter 19, beginning to read at the 23rd verse. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together, along with the workmen in related trades, and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray num large numbers of people here in Ephesus, and in pra practically the whole province of Asia. He says that ma man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon, the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's travelling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theatre. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theatre. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! The city clerk quietened the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have, not, they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, 
we would not be able to account for this commotion, since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of the Lord. And thank you, Fitty, very much as well. Well, there was very obviously, obviously a, a clash of creeds that day in Ephesus, wasn't there? As, of course, there still is in the world today. And so now we're going to sing about the only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the song Above the Clash of Creeds. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, shall we pray before we look at God's Word together? Father in heaven, thank you that we can be together this morning, even if we're not physically together. Uh, please help us, uh, wherever we are, to uh, think on your truth, help us to have uh, ears that hear, soft hearts that take it in. Uh, down deep, uh, and please give us wills that uh, to act on it. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, uh, what are you most dependent on in life? What are you most dependent on in life? It could be any number of things. What are you most dependent on in life? And what would you think and feel if it was taken away from you? Well, more on that later, but uh, let's just set the scene. Uh, the Ephesians loved Artemis. Artemis was the Greek name of the goddess Diana in classical mythology. She was goddess of the moon and hunting. In Ephesus, the worship of Artemis seemed to have been fused with some fertility cult as well. The temple of Artemis in Ephesus was massive. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It measured 220 by 425 feet with 127 marble columns, each 62 feet high. The statue of the goddess was displayed in an inner room of the temple and there were cult centers for uh, the Ephesian Artemis, Artemis um, that have been identified in more than 30 ancient cities. So many Artemis followers would come from far and wide to see their goddess in Ephesus. It meant that Ephesus had a big attraction up its sleeve, didn't it? Something that drew in loads of people from all over. It would be a bit like having a Legoland built here in Terrington. Imagine that. I'd love it. Um, Legoland Terrington. The A17 would be even more of a nightmare, wouldn't it? But anyway, Artemis generated a lot of business for the city. And a lot of people made their living from this following. But there was a problem for the idol worshippers in Ephesus and the wider region, as highlighted by a chap called Demetrius. Look with me at verses 23 to 26. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, you know, my friends, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see in here, this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. So the way that uh, he mentions, the way Christians with the message of the cross was spreading throughout the region. Remember the burning of the four million pounds worth of scrolls last time? That would have been big news on the Ephesian Facebook page. It was probably talked about on the local radio station and made the local newspaper. People were talking about the way and here in these verses, we note that Demetrius, the silversmith, states that there are large numbers of people in Ephesus and throughout the province of Asia who had been led astray by Paul. Loads of people had heard the message of the cross that Paul had and his companion, sorry, loads of people had heard the message of the cross that Paul and his companions preached, and loads of them had become Christians. Now, this was a big problem for Demetrius and his fellow tradesmen, wasn't it? Because Christians don't buy little statues of a false god. No, their savior is now the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's bad news for Demetrius's business. And notice at the end of verse 26, Demetrius quotes Paul, 
He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. He recalls some of Paul's preaching, which as a preacher is fantastic, isn't it? You want people to remember what you said. They are words which challenged his trade to the very core. Gods made by human hands are no gods at all. The goddess they worship is a fake god, just a creation by humans, unable to help and unable to save. It really is bad news. They perhaps needed to find another use for their skills with metal, stone, and whatever else was involved. They were idolaters challenged by the way. And if we can just have those uh, three points up, Mike, thanks. They were, uh, sorry, the first, sorry, just the first point. Um, they were idolaters uh, challenged by the way. The way, the message of the cross proclaims that there is only one true God, the creator God of heaven and earth. He is the only one to be worshipped. And we can see this in the Old Testament, in the uh, first and second commandments. Only worship one God, the true and living God, and don't bow down to idols. We did that in our All Age Service series uh, last year, didn't we? But human hearts are idol factories, and we worship all sorts of things, don't we? We're all guilty of idolatry. We naturally ignore the Creator God and chase after other fake gods. When the created, that's us, don't acknowledge our Creator God who sustains all life, but we just take all His good gifts but don't acknowledge him, then we must face the consequences. We read in the Bible that God is a just God. No one will escape giving an account for what they have done in this life. The challenge is to turn back to God. We can do this by turning our minds around from life being all about us to being about God. And we're called to believe in his rescue plan through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. People are brought back into a right relationship with God by believing in the Lord Jesus and what he did. It's God who took on human flesh, lived the perfect life we never could. Jesus didn't have any idols. He died on the cross to take the penalty for our sins and was raised and is now seated in heaven. Only God saves. Have you been challenged by the way? Have you turned from idols to the true and living God? From worshipping created things to worshipping the creator? We must hear and act on the challenge, mustn't we? Hear the message that God wants you to turn back to him. Idolaters challenged by the way. Let's keep going and have a look at our second heading. Thanks, Mike. Verses 27 to 31. Idolaters dependent on the pay. Idolaters dependent on the pay. Verse 27. There is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. It was a hard message to process for these tradesmen, wasn't it? Their God, their trade, and their livelihood was all in danger. It highlighted their dependence on Artemis, 
and the pay that they received from making statues of her. They were threatened. Their safety net was being cut, and they got mad about it. There was an uproar. They seized Paul's companions, and they went to that public meeting place. It was a very dangerous situation. The fuse on the dynamite had been lit, and it didn't take long for the situation to explode. Thankfully, Paul's friends kept him away from the blast. But when you challenge people's safety nets, when you knock over people's idols, then you get a reaction. What's your safety net? What are you dependent on? Perhaps you're watching and your hope is not in God, but in another human. Perhaps your safety net is how much you own, whether your mortgage is paid off or not. Maybe you say you believe in Jesus, but you put moralism above Jesus, thinking that your behavior and your attitudes will keep you safe or contribute to your salvation. How would you react if your safety net was taken away or threatened? Don't get me wrong, there's many good things that we have in this life that we'd be sad about if we lost, and that, that's right, isn't it? But if there are things in life that we would consider life not worth living if we lost them, then that might be an indication that they are idols. I really don't, I really hope that this doesn't happen to anyone. But imagine with me for a moment, if you lost everything, your job, your pension pot, if you've got one, your house, your spouse, Would you be angry about it? I'm not minimizing the pain here. The pain would be like getting hit in the chest by a train. It would be very awful. It would be very sad. And it would be very painful. But in the end, what would you be left with? Would you be left with just Jesus? Or would you be left with anger, blame, confusion, and hopelessness? Would you be like the silversmiths in Ephesus who got mad when the thing they depended on was threatened? Or would you be depending on Jesus, knowing that he still loves you, that he is with you in your pain and that he has saved you for eternity. Would you say to yourself in the middle of the hard time something like, it's okay. The creator of the universe is with me and he loves me more than I can know. I've still got Jesus. Would you say or think that? Idolaters dependent on the pay. And thinking of verses 32 to 41, our final heading. Thanks, Mike. And this is, you're going to like this one because it's kind of a Robert um, point. Idolaters caused the fray. And fray, as well as meaning becoming worn at a uh, fabric, becoming worn at the edges, fray can also mean an energetic and often not well organized effort, activity, fight, or disagreement. So idolaters caused the fray. Verse 32. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. 
he motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So there's a big riot going on, isn't there? It's a dangerous situation. The people are confused. Many don't even know why they're there. A Jew gets up and to try and address the, address the crowd, but his monotheistic view, he believes in one God. That angers the crowd too. They shout, great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. Can you imagine it? It's like shouting for two hours of these services back to back. And then the town clerk comes along and reasons with them. In Ephesus, the clerk was the highest local official and would be the go-between with the Roman officials. He points out to the crowd that they had better calm down because their behavior could get them into big trouble. They could be charged for rioting. It's interesting that the clerk managed to get their attention by feeding them the lie that they believed in, verses 35 and 36. Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. The town clerk gave them their comfort blanket back. On a positive note, however, the clerk does point out that the Christians haven't done anything against them. Verse 37. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. It's the idolaters who caused the fray. The believers weren't going around kicking off about Artemis. They weren't being provocative. The message challenged the silversmiths and what they were doing. We want people to hear the message and be challenged by it, don't we? But we also live in peace as best we can. We ought to be the good neighbors. We try and be the best sons and the best daughters or the best parents. Sometimes people will react to the gospel message in ways which we might not expect. It might be pretty scary. We may lose some friends. We may have different, a different relationship with family members who react against the message. We need to be careful that people are reacting to the message and not the messenger. For if we go about with a bit of an attitude, thinking we are in the right, then it may be us who needs to change. It underlines the manner that the messenger needs to have an attitude of humbleness, knowing themselves to be a sinner and saved only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Idolaters challenged by the way. Gods made by human hands are no gods at all. We need to turn to God if we haven't done already. Idolaters dependent on the pay. Let's not be dependent on idols, but the one who saves, Jesus Christ. Idolaters cause the fray. Pray that we remain firm in difficult times, faithful to God and his word, whilst being kind and respectful to all. Do we want a riot in Terrington? Not like that of Ephesus, but, but we do want the message of the cross to be heard and for people to be challenged by it so that they too can depend on God who saves. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for sending the Lord Jesus to save us. Please help us to have the right response to the message of the cross. 
Help us to be totally dependent on you and not on idols. And we pray that you would help us to share your message. Help us to be uh, kind. Help us to be gentle and patient as we hold firmly to your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mark, very much indeed. And as usual, if you have any uh, comments or questions which uh, arise out of uh, Mark's sermon, do feel free to be in touch with him by uh, email or by phone for a chat. Uh, that goes for any of our sermons. Uh, we're always uh, happy to take up any questions or uh, uh, issues, whatever, that arise out of a sermon and to help as much as we can. But thank you very much, uh, Mark, indeed. So Paul knew that uh, though the nations rage and uh, the kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king uh, reigning over all. And so now we come to our next song, Though the Nations Rage.
Thank you very much to our musicians. What is a new song to us there, isn't it? Uh, right there. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Our God is the Ancient of Days, and he delights to hear our prayers. And now Zena is going to lead our intercessions. Thank you, Zena. Good morning. I hope you will all join me in our prayers today for those of you in church and for those watching at home. Let us pray. Your Bible teaches us how we should live our lives. May your Holy Spirit transform us to make us more like you would have us be. Give us wisdom in our lives as we pray to you and help us to live our lives to your rules and not earthly rules. Father God, we live in such unusual times at the moment with the threat of the coronavirus. Give us strength to cope with the restrictions that are in place this month. We pray for all those who are alone in their homes, unable to have company, and who must be so lonely. Give them your grace to cope with life as it is at the moment and keep them safe. Lord Jesus, we pray particularly for all those suffering from the virus. We pray that they will recover without any lasting effects. We pray for all the doctors and nurses who are caring for all those who are ill. Give them the strength, the skill and the energies to carry on with their jobs. We thank you, Lord, for all those in the medical and caring professions. May they be kept safe and healthy. We pray for those working on the vaccine to give people protection from this horrible virus. May they quickly find what is needed to stop more people becoming infected. Lord Jesus, we pray for all the politicians making very difficult decisions of how to manage this situation that we are in. Guide them to make the right decisions to prevent the virus from spreading any more and to slow down the speed of the spread. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for those who are sick in mind and body and spirit. Give them courage and peace in their hearts. We pray especially for Sue, David and Emma and all those known to us. Father God, we bring before you all those who mourn. May they feel your comfort and love at this time. May they soon come to remember their loved ones with happiness rather than sorrow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for church leaders that they will be united in your name. May any problems be resolved and that their energies will be directed to your work and glory. May they be true to your word and teach others to respond to you. Lord Jesus, we pray for all world leaders that they will make the right decisions and will be free, free your world to follow and believe in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much for the safe delivery of Abigail to Lucy and Martin. May she grow up in faith and wisdom as a new member of our church family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Almighty God, give us your wisdom to understand how you want us to live, that we may follow you more clearly and obey your word. gathering our prayers and praises into one as the Saviour has taught us. So we pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Zena, very much indeed. And so we've come to our last song for this morning. Uh, as, a, as a church, we might not uh, provoke many riots, but it's as true uh, now as it was then that other lords still hold sway in most human beings' lives. Indeed, we know their pull in our own lives. Even uh, when we're believers and we know the Lord Jesus, we know the pull of other idols, as we've been thinking about this morning. But we know that they still hold sway, complete sway, unhindered sway in many people's lives. That uh, thus, unnumbered souls are dying and pass into the night. And so, knowing that we have the same commission as Paul and the same glad message as Paul, we pray that the Lord will defend us from cowardice, awaken us from lethargy, and send us on his errands to labor for his sake. And so, our final song this morning, the hymn, Facing a Task Unfinished. And a moment of quiet before our final prayer. He says that man made gods are no gods at all. 
Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to remember that this week, that uh, whatever gods we might try and make for ourselves, they are no gods at all, that you are the one true God. And we pray that uh, you will help us to walk in the way, your way, with you alone as our God. Help us, we pray, to be thoughtful as we root out the idols that still try to have their say in our lives, whatever they might be. Help us to be uh, vigorous about this, not to shy away from being wholehearted for you. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us again. Next week, uh, we continue uh, our walk through the middle of the book of Acts. Of course, uh, now we're on Paul's third missionary journey. I think I said second earlier. We've moved on to his third one now, and uh, we'll continue uh, with that again uh, next week. So thanks very much to you for joining us. Um, whether you're, as I say, a regular church member or you're visiting us, you're very welcome. It's good to have you. Thanks to all those who've made this uh, service possible here in church. Please don't forget the uh, Zoom conversation coming up uh, in a little while at uh, 11.30. Do join in with that if you're able. But thank you very much indeed, and uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>